Welcome to Education Matters, presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Mary Ann Wolf. While schools and districts are struggling to know what to do and how to best meet the needs of our students, the shift to hybrid or remote learning plans have had a dramatic impact on our families and students. During this episode, we will meet with four guests who will help us better understand the challenges and also offer some recommendations for how we must continue to improve in our engagement and support of families and students. I am thrilled to be joined by two exceptional educators who are creative problem solvers and meeting the needs of all of our students. Kelly Johnson is the principal and lead learner of Innovation Academy at South Campus in Johnson County Public Schools. And Lisa Godwin is a kindergarten teacher in Dixon Elementary in Onslow County Schools and a former teacher of the year. Kelly and Lisa, you now both have a lot of experience in jumping into remote learning without any notice this past spring, and I know you're busy for planning for what the school year will bring. Can you just take a moment and share with us how you're going to apply what you learned from the spring as we go into this new year? And I'd love to start with Lisa. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me today. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, just kind of share with the community uh, what, where we've been and where we're going um, with remote learning in the next few months. Um, I learned so much uh, from uh, those last months of school. And uh, one of the biggest lessons that I learned is relationships are vital uh, to success. And, um, and I, I realized that that meant I was gonna have to think outside the box to make that happen. So uh, there were a lot of drive-bys uh, to, to visit my students because even if it was at a social distance, I needed to lay eyes on those, on those babies. And I needed those parents to know that I was invested and that um, I was willing to you know, put my feet uh, you know, on the ground and <laughs> make my way to them uh, to help them in any way that I could. Um, so moving forward, I know that that's what I'm going to have to do again in this coming year uh, to really build those relationships, to stay in contact with these, these parents. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of them do not have access to internet, so it's going to have to be me physically going out um, and also making phone calls, staying in contact with them, um, you know, through mail. Uh, anything that, that I can do to, to help these parents feel supported because they are the key. They're, they're my partner. And without them, then I'm not going to be a successful educator with those children. Um, the relationship piece, you know, uh, we're built here at Innovation Academy on three distinct uh, tenets. And the first one of those is relationships. And so, um, you know, though we had the benefit in the spring of having um, the three quarters prior to that to establish those face to face, um, you know, I still believe that it can be done. We just have to think about it in a different way. Um, Lisa used the term thinking outside of the box. Um, as, as the lab school of Johnson County, that's what we were designed to do. And so um, a very, very much of what we do is outside of the box. Um, and so we're trying to redefine the box. And I think this is a great opportunity, you know, to, to show how it can be done. Um, and with, you know, with elementary school teachers, which Lisa, by the way, I believe that you all should wear superhero capes. Um, <laughs> I don't know how people work with the little people. I think they're wonderful, but um, so adolescence being our comfort zone here, um, you know, it is a different kind of conversation because, you know, see, when we have the, the layers of development uh, for adolescents anyway, um, and then you add on to this, the, the disappointment of their not being able to have those face-to-face -face social interactions that they, that they thrive on. Um, and so we try to give them those as much as possible, understanding that um, until they, they feel that human connection, um, then it is very difficult to create um, really genuine and authentic learning experiences. Kelly, would you share with us a few of the specific strategies you are using and plan to use with your families and students to keep them engaged? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so because we understand that, you know, we, we are teachers um, and parents, you know, feel overwhelmed um, by, by that um, by that undertaking, even even those of them who are teachers, you know, they're trying to teach their own 
um, children at home as well as um, their students in the online environment. And so we continued to offer to our students the opportunity to get online at certain times um, to connect with their advisory groups um, that were already you know, scheduled and, and put in place. You know, and when I say offer, I think it's really important language to note because we gave that structure, we offered that, but then also there are real situations where flexibility um, is key. And so we have, to, we have to give access in whatever way um, that child and that family can um, can get that access because it is different for every situation. One way or another, however long it takes, you know, in whatever way it takes, uh, we will connect. Great. And Lisa, um, I think I've told you before that my mom was a kindergarten teacher. And so um, kindergarten teachers have a very special place in my heart. And I know that many of our parents and guardians, especially those of our younger students, are really concerned about how they're going to juggle supporting their kids and supporting their learning. And so I wonder if you have any advice for families and for communities that are trying to support um, their students and how they can best do that, especially as they try to juggle sometimes working from home or not being able to be at home and other things. Well, my first bit of advice is to show yourself grace. Um, this is new for everyone and it's not going to be perfect. It's not, and that's okay. Um, you know, just take it day by day and sometimes hour by hour, minute by minute. Uh, but in order to support my parents uh, last year, and I will do this again this year, I actually created like a video um, and it, it kind of gave them ideas of how to balance their day with their children to make sure that they're not um, having too much screen time, to make sure that there are are times in the day where these kids are given opportunities to still be a kid, to still play, to not, um, you know, just be absorbed just on academics, and how to also weave academics into their daily schedule. Uh, for instance, when you're cooking dinner, that's a great time to do some math lessons, you know, with measurement and counting and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, during bath time, you know, you can, you know, put shaving cream on the side of the, the, the tub and, you know, say, hey, you know, can you write the letter B? What sound does the letter B make? Um, you know, do a math equation, um, you know, using the shaving cream. And, you know, you can get all kinds of different, uh, you know, floats and things that are letters and numbers, shapes that you can throw into the, the bathtub with the kids. That's an excellent time to do academics, but you're weaving it into your daily schedule. Yeah. It doesn't always have to look like school. And I was on call from seven in the morning until nine at night. I cut it off at nine, <laughs> but I was on call you know, during that time period because I know that parent schedules are different. And you know, if a parent gets off at six, that, they're gonna be working with their kids when they get home. So they might need me during that time. So making myself flexible as well uh, to support these parents and let them know they are not alone. Great, well, Great. thank well, you so thank much. You and it. Kelly, I wonder if you have any final advice. Um, I know that you know, it sometimes feels or often feels as though we are individual agents you know, in this process. I think it's important. And in the middle school, we're set up this way in terms of teaming it's really important for our teams to, um, and they may be at other levels, I'm not as familiar, um, but to, to, to lean in on each other in those teams. And that was another strategy that we utilized um, heavily um, in the spring. You know, we knew that we had to get our message um, defined clearly as a team, as a large team, as well as within our micro teams, our grade level and content area teams. Um, and so that we could share those weekly um, videos with our parents and with our students to give them, you know, those structures, those offerings, um, those supports. And, um, you know, but we knew we had to get our message consistent first. And then right. also as far as, as far as, um, you know, the, what we offer to them as well, when we would meet in those teams, you know, and I would be in as many of them as I could be. We also found, you know, places where, where parents, we could tell that parents were really, um, you know, um, able to, to assist in, um, you know, consistently as well as when students were really 
um, being very self-directed. And so then I would get those names and I would send them a personal note, you know, from right. me just to say, hey, you know, you're doing great. Keep it up. You know, really appreciate it. Um, and then also for those who were, we were, you know, having difficulties at times, you know, it was it ebbed and flowed. Um, but at times to connect with, just to reach out to say, how can we help you? I could just have so many more questions for you, but I also just appreciate how you have been so creative to meet the needs of families, teachers, and our students. And thank you for all you are doing. And I cannot wait for the day when I can visit both of your schools and see all this in action. But I love what you're doing for our kids and families before then. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. As we strive to empower families and students in remote and hybrid learning environments, we know that certain students or populations of students have more significant or unique challenges. We are very pleased today to be joined by two people who will share more about how we can engage and support our students and families of color and our students with disabilities. I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Devanya Govin Hunt, who is a Charlotte Mecklenburg parent and also the president of the Charlotte affiliate of Black Child Development Institute, and Leslie Welch, who is a Wake County Schools parent. We know that you both bring very unique and interesting perspectives to this work, and I'm wondering if you'll both share with us some of the primary challenges you're seeing our families and students face in this shift to hybrid and remote learning. Devanya? Absolutely. Uh, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here and to be able to share, um, you know, perspectives about such a, during such a critical, critical time. Uh, it has been very interesting um, since March, <laughs> since the closing of schools, it has been very interesting. COVID swept in and completely turned our lives upside down. Um, and BCDI Charlotte has been on the ground in classrooms and in school buildings, um, reaching children, teachers, and families. So we kind of delivered a direct kind of service um, situation around literacy. And of course, with schools closing, that changed everything, right? Because it made it more challenging for us to be able to get our hands on parents, our hands on students that were receiving these services. And so we've had to shift kind of the way that we delivered our services with the understanding that parents were coming to us expressing um, some of the challenges that they faced. And some of those challenges fall around just being able to manage, right? Just being able to manage um, homeschooling a child, especially when they've got no training, right? No formal training in, in teaching and no formal training in delivering literacy instructions and wanting the best for their children, but not knowing how to do it and then still manage keeping the house afloat. So we're talking about, you know, job loss, job insecurities. We're talking about food insecurities. We're talking about mental health challenges because of all the stress that all of this kind of fell out of the sky. And then some of our families, this has been magnified 10 times over because these challenges already existed, right? But now that um, this whole situation, this whole pandemic started, it just kind of magnified it and intensified everything. So, so parents are having a really, really difficult time just trying to manage, trying to manage time, trying to understand that they actually can, um, they can contribute to their child's education and they can help manage that. You know, they just need to know how to do it. Uh, yeah. So it's been very stressful for them. It is very stressful. And Leslie, I know you bring a different perspective, but probably share some of some similar challenges. So I'm curious to hear what, what you view as the challenges our families are facing. I would say that one of the things that's kind of the unspoken in the room with regard to schools and children with disabilities um, is that it also often is the only break a family gets. You have very challenging children. Um, myself, I have a 17 year old who's nonverbal and 6'3", and um, whether it allows our families to work during the day or both people or it allows our families to 
just get a breather because let's say you have a child with very significant behavioral issues as well as personal care issues is all, you know, just add, 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 add. Um, it's, it's thrown a monkey wrench in all of that. And so you've got families that don't know are, are coping at the, you know, base level to begin with, just getting by every day, getting that kid to school every day, getting everything right, and then taking back over in the afternoon. And now that all just went, you know, all at once. Um, and I would say the one of the most challenging parts of it has not been so much, I mean, has been that obviously it all went, came apart at once, but there's no, up until really, really recently, so you're talking about what, four months now, going at five, been a lot of uncertainty as to where we were going with all of this. At any one time, there was plan A or plan B or plan C or, and that's just the schools. And she talked about uh, not having um, training that, I mean, it really comes home, you know, hits home when you don't have training in how to teach a child stuff for special ed. Well, and it's such a good reminder, Leslie and Devanya, about the importance of the structures that schools also provide in addition to all the services and understanding of how to meet the needs of students and even having access, Devanya, as you're talking about, to those services. I really uh, appreciate that perspective. And, you know, I also want us to think about, are there some strategies that you've been able to use or that you've seen that really do that? And knowing, Devanya, that you've worked so closely to support families with literacy, what has this shift to remote learning meant for that? What have you been able to do? Mm -hmm. So we have been able to work directly with um, a number of schools, working with the school leaders, the administrative team, the guidance counselors, and literacy facilitators to be able to connect us to families, um, and especially in their lower grades, because the research tells us that the lower grades will be hit the hardest in terms of learning loss and literacy loss. So we've been able to work directly with them to get our hands on families, to be able to connect us with those families that they know needed 10 times as much, you know, 10 times more help than maybe some other families. Um, and through those connections, we have uh, changed the way that we deliver services by offering curbside events. What that means is we actually partner with our local grocery stores, um, like Food Lion is one, for example, and we go out every other Saturday um, and use tools that Read Charlotte has made available to us called the Reading Checkup. And we set up on the curb of those grocery stores and we offer food line gift cards to help with food insecurities for those families that need it. We sign people up for Reading Checkup and teach them how to use the tool. And then we wow. also teach parents how to log into our virtual events so that they, we can actually walk them through step by step on what the yeah. results mean, how to use the tool, and we also tell them, teach them how to break down their time at home yeah. so that they can actually manage getting these activities done. And we remind them yeah. that the power is in their hands. Yes, and once again, putting structure. And Leslie, we only have a little bit more time left, but I did wonder if you have some strategies that you've seen be successful or advice that you might have for families that are in similar situations as you've described. Structure is really the key. Um, and reaching out to support organizations, like if you're in the Autism Community, the Autism Society of North Carolina, ones of those that have resources for you online, there's often tons of information out there that they can get, parents can get their hands on. Many times it's free to help structure up your home setting, um, which for any kid helps, but for kids with disabilities, especially autism, structure, 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 um, and just bringing everything kind of tenor down, you know? Yeah. Um, trying to get yourself calm. I know for us, the first two, after the first two months passed, my, you know, anxiety was way down and it really helped calm the house. Yeah. Just get through and figure out that every day is just that, that day. You're just trying yeah. to, day, you're just trying to put one foot in front of the other and achieve that day. Yeah. And, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Get so upset about all the things you're not achieving. Right, but, and, and we go back to patience and grace, right? And how yes. we can give that to each yes. other in our schools. And, yes. you know, as we circle back um, on this episode, we also have the chance to hear from a teacher and a principal and how they're working to engage and hoping that the examples that you all have both shared can also tap into some of those structures, but also sharing with teachers and principals what's working with the work you're doing. You all bring such an important perspective. I know there are so many people nodding their heads right now as you speak, and we will uh, you know, be so, we're so pleased that we can share that. And 
I'm just grateful for the work you're both doing, but also your willingness to share just how hard it is, but also that there are steps we can all take. So thank you so much, Devanya and Leslie, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. This past week, a beloved educator and community member, as well as Halifax County's Principal of the Year, Tysha Patterson, passed away due to COVID-19. I had the opportunity to know him and all of the work he has done to better education and equity. Our thoughts are with him and his community during this time. As a parent of a rising college freshman, college senior, and a ninth grader, I have been losing a lot of sleep over what the year 2020 will be like for each of my children. I worry about what they have already missed this year when it comes to learning and life's milestones, and I wonder when they will get to fully re-engage in many of the activities they love. As we face the uncertainty of this upcoming school year, I'm also reflecting on how important our school community has been to our family and my children. Last week, my son's coach gave him a special book chosen for each of his high school senior athletes to bring some closure to a year that was like none other. Throughout our transition to remote learning this spring and even into the summer, I saw my youngest child connecting with school friends on a daily basis through Google Meet and FaceTime, forging bonds I didn't think were possible through a screen. Throughout these past four months, I saw neighbors and community members make sure students in need had access to food every day, including over the weekend. All of these instances remind me, in ways big and small, that we must do everything that we can to understand where our educators, our families, and our students are and try to meet their needs so that our children can continue to learn and grow during a very uncertain time. This is the very definition of equity. Not equal inputs or the same approach for all, but rather understanding the needs of each student and striving to meet them. And it has never been more important than right now. Some families have lost income, while others have a difficult time communicating with their schools due to language barriers. Others have very unique learning needs and require services that are challenging to adapt to a remote learning environment. While some cannot access the internet and consequently feel very far apart from their school community, many families and children worry about the basics right now, like food and safety. And to many have always had these struggles, not just during COVID-19. Today on our show, educators, parents, and family advocates shared specific strategies to support our school communities, which include students, families, and educators during remote or hybrid learning scenarios. You heard about the importance of connection with schools, teachers, and peers again and again as paramount in a child's ability to continue their academic and social and emotional learning. As we go into this new year, it is imperative that we provide opportunities that school communities can depend on in terms of forging strong connections. Some students will have very unique needs ranging from the basics like school supplies to time with a counselor or social worker. Families may also need guidance in how to support their children from how to develop a routine or schedule to how to find accessible childcare. Educators who likely have been toiling throughout the summer to plan for this unprecedented fall will need support from us too. We need to go above and beyond for them by asking how we can show up and offer help in ways that may stretch us and strengthen us at the same time. COVID-19 has forced us to approach education differently and no stakeholder in education is able to work, learn, or support their child the way they did before. We must continue to be creative and to work with others to meet the needs of each child this fall because as it's guaranteed in our state constitution, each and every one of our children deserves access to a sound basic education. Thank you for taking time with us to learn and think about education. That's all for today, and we'll see you next week.